Hello, comic creators. Welcome to the latest episode of Comics Connection podcast for February 1st, 2023. As always, my name is Gamal Hennessy. With me is Andy Schmidt. And we are here to talk about the major stories within the comic book industry for the past two weeks. Andy, how are you doing? I'm all right. Uh, still got a lingering cough, so I apologize if I cough on our podcast. Yeah, please don't cough on the podcast. I mean, uh, well, I'm, you know, during it, I'm not gonna cough on the podcast. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna cough on you or our listeners. But I just apologize. Okay. You've been, you've been right. warned. There might be some, some coughing. Yeah, we'll try to, we'll try to fix that in post. Uh, let's start off with the biggest story that is the most recent story, and that is the continuing um, shenanigans, let's call them, over at Comixology. Just as way of background for anyone who may not be aware, uh, Comixology was the major distribution channel for digital comics in North America for quite some time. They were purchased by Amazon. And for years, they were kind of left to their own devices. And people just, you know, went and used Comixology the way they always used Comixology. Last year, however, Comixology kind of got absorbed, folded into crushed, depending on how you look at it, into the Kindle system. And that actually created a lot of changes in the user experience, <laughs> both for the, oh, there you go, he's coughing again, yeah, there it is. both for the users who are actually reading the comics and for the publishers who are uploading comics. Um, for one, you couldn't buy comics directly from the app. You had to go to the website, buy comics, and then go back to the app. Then you couldn't. Um, there was quite a few things in terms of pricing, in terms of what was actually available. All of it kind of became much less user-friendly and much less desirable to, um, to interact with. And last week or the week before, Comixology as a as part of the larger trend in both Amazon and tech companies overall, laid off a significant portion of its workforce. I think between now and October, thousands of people will lose their job at Comixology, which raises the specter of Comixology dwindling into a place where it is not not just the not the major player in digital comics, but not even a relevant factor in digital comics. So Andy, my question to you is how, A, how do you see this kind of impacting the wider landscape of comics? But why don't you answer that first? Cause I have a more specific question that I think is more relevant to our viewers. Okay. Um, well, I think it's kind of terrible. Um, in the short term, it's definitely terrible uh, because there is not, and I imagine this is one of the questions you want to get to, there is not really a another company or even really a couple of companies that stitch together and fill like this sort of vacuum being created for digital comics. Uh, at least not, not that I'm aware of. Um, and I am actively really researching it. Um, so, you know, we'll see. Uh, and then part of that, and that's not to say there aren't good companies that have digital comics. Um, there are, they just have different business models or whatever. So there's nothing that's there to like replace the user experience of mm -hmm. comicsology that in, in a, in a big way. Um, it's terrible for all the people that are laid off. Um, uh, my, my hope is that a good number of them will still find work at publishers or other companies within the comics industry because Lord knows we could use them. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of really good people uh, that are have gotten let go and are being let go. Um, so yeah, I mean, in the short term, pretty terrible. Um, and the prospects for another company being able to come on board and do what Comixology did and really fill that hole in a big way, I think are small and i think it's also much more difficult to do today than it was back in 2005 or three whenever they started that is true and i think it's true for a few reasons one because every major publisher or a lot of major publishers just develop their own app 
So the idea of having right. one place that everybody would go to get comics is no longer even, it doesn't even make sense from a business model perspective because Comixology was not sharing their numbers. Comixology was not necessarily responsive to people's, um, from a publisher standpoint, to people's needs. Comixology was not very transparent with what was going on under the hood. So it made more sense for a lot of companies to just have their own digital storefronts and then have their own comics coming out, which kind of diversifies and opens up everything for people. But now as a user, instead of just going to, you cannot replicate the, I'm going to the comic shop to look at all the comics when it comes to digital. Now it's like, right. well, I got to go to the DC app and the Marvel app and the IDW app. And then I got to go to Webtoons and then I got to go over to Global Comics and then Tapas. And then after a while, you're like, it becomes kind of like the subscription services for streaming because everything is kind of everywhere and you're not really it takes a lot of effort to go sift through to look for comics. So I think the next question, which is the major question, is if you are a publisher who's trying to build a business for your own comics, and part of what you want to do is digital because everybody has a phone, how, how would you, how are you actually looking at it as publisher of CEX in terms of a digital strategy, knowing that comicsology may or may not be a viable solution yeah um so when they switched over to the kindle version we you know saw sales stop mm -hmm. um so it just at that point you know it becomes it's not even worth doing like the file conversions and the and getting everything uploaded like that that takes time and money and effort and frustration Right, no matter which one of these platforms you're dealing with. And so it, it becomes a question of is that time, money, frustration valuable? Is it worth what you get out of it? And the, the real black and white way to look at that is do I make more money by putting that up than I spent putting it up? Right. right. But that's not really how we tend to evaluate things. The other two big factors that I tend to look at are. Beyond just the dollars and cents, does it work? I might be able to make a case like, hey, we probably lose 50 bucks for every book that we put up, but we're in this place and it's a high traffic place. It gets the CX name out there, it gets the title out there. Maybe we're, we're convincing some people to go buy the print copy or whatever. Like you can, you can maybe make a case that there is, there is value beyond just, I made a sale. Mm -hmm. But the, on the flip side of that, just on that time, effort standpoint it's very easy to make the case that any time and effort put into putting any single issue up on that platform or a lot of these other ones is better spent doing something else that gets me a further reach either in the digital space or somewhere else or is part of a crowdfunding campaign or is part of whatever like there are so many other ways that have a larger return on that time energy money investment than getting the books up at most of these the digital platforms, that's the part of the argument that's really hard to overcome, right? Mm -hmm. If we're doing this, then we're not doing this thing, and this thing seems like it would be really good for us. Yeah. Whereas this seems okay for us. That's the part of the equation that I'm struggling with the most. And what we're looking at is, is there a place that is gonna bring enough traffic um, of people that theoretically would are interested in, in the types of books that we do. Um, mm. And that's an ongoing search right now. I mean, we haven't made any conclusions. I think we're circling in on a conclusion here that we would at least want to try out. But you're right. I mean, the problem right now is I don't know that there's ever going to be another, you know, app or or digital storefront, put it that way, maybe, it's, maybe that's the best way to put it, where you have Marvel, DC, Image, Dark Horse, all of those together, plus all the indie, plus the creator own. I mean, when they switched to Kindle, Comic Comicsology Submit, which was all of the in individual creators, like that thing was just basically done. Like it just, mm -hmm. they weren't gonna take a new stuff at that point. So they've been dismantling it, you know, whether consciously dismantling it or just death by a thousand cuts for quite a while. But 
for a smaller publisher or an independent creator that's just trying to get their book up there, they need to be on a platform that has a, the Marvel and the DC and the image that is going to bring, it's going to bring the traffic that goes, oh, I might also like. And that was, you know, early on, Comicsology actually did a really great job of recommending titles. If you mm-hmm. like Batman, then you might like Shadowhawk at Image, or you might like you know, X at Dark Horse or these indie comics. And it would get down into like creator own comics. So mm-hmm. Comicsology actually did a really good job in some of the ways that they recommended titles or pushed titles up to the front of of giving space to, giving uh um and that I think came from the founders of Comicsology who really love comics, you know, and and I assume Amazon also loves comics because big corporate entities tend to have to be passionate about art forms mm-hmm. as we well know. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's a thing, yeah. isn't it? Well, let me ask a question. This is just a theoretical question based on the, the two open ideas that you talked about. One being that putting the comics up, could be seen as not a sales effort, but a marketing effort. If it is a marketing effort, and you said, well, there's other things that could be, other time and effort that could be better spent, how do you feel about the idea of using that time instead of using Comixology or Tapas or Webtoon or Global or anybody else as not as a sales function, but as a marketing function. So instead of we're going to put this comic up because we want to sell it, we're basically putting the comic up so people see it and then push them in a sales funnel to buy it from somewhere else, either back the Kickstarter, order the print copy, yada, yada, yada. But if that's the case, then does it really make sense to upload the comic itself or to just engage in more online marketing efforts that don't necessarily involve uploading the comic at all? Well, I mean, it may be a case by case, right? There may be cases Mm -hmm. where that makes sense to upload the comic, maybe cases where it doesn't make as much sense. You know, if you're, if you're, let's say you're running a crowdfunding campaign for a book and, you know, you think, you know, that people that like Telgemeier's ghosts or, Mm -hmm smile will like it i don't know that putting that comic up digitally is is going to be helpful because that's probably not where those where those where fans of those books are going at the mm-hmm. moment right um but if you're like hey um you know there's this great webtoons book maybe we'll put this up on webtoons because it's similar and whatever then okay well then maybe that makes sense so maybe a case by case thing what i can say is that there are two places where right now we're we're confident we're going to be using digital comics, right? You're, it's not that we're not going to sell them. So you can, for us at CEX, um, you'll be able to get them off our website, right? If you don't mm-hmm. want to, if you want to buy the comic, but you don't want to pay the shipping cost, maybe, right? Because mm-hmm. that can be annoying. Um, you can buy the comic and get it at, you know, a cover price or whatever and have it delivered to you for free digitally. You can have a digital, you know, you can get the, you can buy the digital PDF from us. I think that's a really viable thing. I like having that option. It keeps books around, even if, you know, we run out of, uh, you know, you can, you can still read it. Uh, and then we'll also probably use them in, in, uh, in ways for like crowdfunding campaigns, right? Like, oh, there's mm-hmm. a digital option and there's that. So they're not going away. Like we're still going to find uses for them, but there's a big difference between if you buy that comic off of our website, uh, versus if you buy it off somebody else's website, right? Um, we collect more money that way, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. I have, no matter where you buy it, I have to pay the creator the exact same royalty, right? right? I mean, that's the way our contracts are set up, right? So, so I want to get, I want to, I want to make a little bit more money on that digital offering to make it count worth, you know, worth worth the time and effort. So. Um, yeah, so so there there are benefits to to running it off of our own website, you know, and mm. selling it there. Um, okay. Like I said, the creator gets the same royalty either way. With us, that's not true for all companies, but with us, they do. Um, so yeah, I it's a it's a big question, you know, like when you were talking about it a minute ago, 
you know, it used to be when I was a kid and we didn't have digital options. We went to the store every week, the comic shop, and I could peruse everything, right? And I could mm-hmm. buy everything that I wanted there. And if there was something special, I could order it and they'd make sure I got it and blah, blah, blah. What you were describing going from service to service to service is the equivalent of there's no way I could have convinced my mom, nor could I convince myself today, mm-hmm. right? Like to drive around and go to six different shops in the city right. to get all the comics that I wanted. It was hard enough when I had, when I was looking for a back issue to convince my mom instead of taking me to the store in in Richmond Heights to take me to the store in Kirkwood was like, man, I am like I owe her like two clean rooms and like a take out the trash twice that week. Like, yeah, it was a big deal. And it's it's the equivalent of the same thing. And you know, talking about those streaming services, like we just cut a bunch of the streaming services, you know, that we subscribe to because you also tend to find ones that I'm spending more time on this one than I am on that one. At some point you make the cut. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that's harder. And for most comic book fans in the U S they'll keep their Marvel subscription, which is cheaper per pound of comic and their DC subscription than they will for some of these others. In fact, on one of our conversations on our discord, somebody somebody was saying like, it'd be great if they all had apps. And I'm like, He's like, I'd, I'd love to be able to get Hellboy. And I'm like, Dark Horse has had its own app for a decade. <laughs> they, have, they, they have had their own app for a decade. And it, I, mm-hmm. I believe it's still going and like still working. And like, they didn't even know. So at some point, you know, there is just a diminishing return to the point where it doesn't work. Well, that is actually a very artful segue to move into our next story because we're going to talk about IDW. Um, IDW had a story that came out, I believe, last week that was related to their fourth quarter earnings for 2022. And they um, posted substantial losses for that quarter. And the more interesting part of the story is that it looked like they needed um, several million dollars of new investment to cover anticipated losses. Now, for those of you who may not be um, financially inclined in terms of like reading 10Ks or 10Qs and stuff like that, it's ba- there. It sounds to me, because I'm not an investment attorney, it sounds to me like they're saying they need more money invested in them to cover money that they already know they're going to lose. Which means it's not money to get new to make new stuff. It's not money to make new deals. It's not money to expand. It's not money to pay people on it's money to that like we already lost the money now we need the money to cover the money we know we already lost so and as a publisher and as a person who is actually involved in the comic book business um what are your thoughts on the current situation with idw especially in light of what's happened recently to aftershock and heavy metal and quite a few of these other companies that are you know similarly situated in the ecosystem uh all right so full disclosure <laughs> i used to be on staff at idw but that was quite a long time ago and uh they weren't losing millions of dollars at the time mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's clear probably, because you were there they weren't you probably weren't because i left that they that they mm-hmm. have, uh they've gotten themselves in this situation no um so I don't know what's, I don't, I don't really have any insight, just uh, also full disclosure. I don't have any insight, you know, behind the curtain on this one. So, uh, largely because I don't think I want to know. <laughs> I don't think I want to ask that question. Um, yeah, the, I, look, if I were looking to invest in a comic book publisher, I think I probably would not invest in the publisher that's like, we've already lost $7 million. <laughs> we need your money to cover that. That's probably not where I'd want to slide a, a few of my own ducats mm-hmm. unless we're misreading that somehow um but and that is that was also my read of of that re- quarterly report um I, from my standpoint like we're building cex differently than a lot of than actually from all of the publishers that you mentioned at least they all took on kind of big investment money and i don't know if it's all venture capitalists or or where exactly all that investor money came from. It may have come from a number of sources. Um, But that's not how I'm building my company. The great thing about taking on that money is, A, 
now I have a whole bunch of money that's, that I can spend to make the coolest stuff I can make right out of the gate, right? That's mm-hmm. awesome. and would be a lot of fun to have that kind of money. The other great thing about getting that big investor money is um, I'm not spending my own money. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm spending someone else's. Also, uh, also more fun than, than the way I'm approaching it. I'm approaching it with CEX that it's all coming out of my pocket, which changes things a lot. A, I don't have that big investor money. We just don't have a ton of money to spend. But it also means that I have to look at things very differently. It's my money. Am I willing to spend the money on this? Do I think that's a good idea? Okay, that's different than I have $10 million. Sure, I'll spend some money. Mm -hmm. We'll see how it goes, right? Like I don't have that luxury. Um, But the benefit is I shouldn't, if I'm at all intelligent, wind up in a spot where I'm so out over my skis financially that I wind up declaring bankruptcy and I stiff a whole bunch of creators and printers and distributors and everyone else, attorneys perhaps, Mm -hmm. um, for work done. Like I, I'm a creator myself and um, I just don't want to do that. Well, well, the thing that I think is that people need to understand, especially if you're an independent and emerging creator and you have this kind of goal and one of your goals is movies and TV shows because you feel like that's going to be like the promised land of your your whole venture. It's helpful to understand that IDW has movies. IDW has TV shows. IDW has been around for what, 25 years, 30 years? Uh, yeah, it's about 20. Yeah, it's about 25 years. So I got hired, I think, in their 10th anniversary, which was 2008 was when I came in. So right. yeah, so like 25 years. Yeah. So the I think what I want people to understand is it's there is no there's nothing wrong with having multimedia distribution as a goal, but multimedia distribution is not the end all be all is not the answer. It's not going to solve um, poor financial management. It's not going to suddenly change the entire nature of the economics of your business. What it may do is may simply amplify the scope. So instead of losing $10,000 because you managed your business poorly, now you've lost $10 million because you managed your business poorly. And that's- yeah. Now, now IDW tried to essentially, uh, and they didn't try to make a studio, but they were producing their own work. So they were financing mm-hmm. television shows and that sort of thing, which is a lot more expensive than financing comics, which are a lot more, it was a lot more expensive than a lot of people think. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I mean, that's why you wind up needing millions upon millions upon millions of dollars. And then if that show doesn't hit or it gets canceled and doesn't get the ratings or whatever, then you're, yeah, again out of your, over your skis really fast without realizing how you did it. And, you know, in a company like that, you know, the, the, the accountants, they don't, they don't differentiate. Like they're, they're not going like, well, these comics made money. So we'll pay those creators the royalties. Though. They go, we don't have any money bankruptcy. Nobody gets paid for nothing. Even mm-hmm. if the work that you did as a comic book creator, graphic novel creator is successful. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it's scary, and but your your point is spot on. Like the 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 movie and TV space is not. It's probably not where I would go to try and rescue my company. Like if we were on shaky financial ground, that's not where I would go to try and and fix the financial situation I'm in. Which I don't think IDW did either. Mm-hmm. Like I, they were doing fine. They went over there. And they started doing these other things. They also did IEW games and one or two other things, I think. But I would look for different aspects of the business. Or maybe I would go, hey, maybe we should shift product to this category or to that, to that, you know, that might perform better or whatever. Like those types of moves I would be more comfortable making as opposed to moving to Los Angeles and deciding that all of a sudden I'm, you know, a big time movie producer. Yeah, yeah. That's probably, that's actually another um, very artful segue to our last story, because we are now going to talk about the um, new investment strategy for Skybound. For those who are not aware, Skybound is the company that um, 
Robert Kirkman is one of the owners of Robert Kirkman being the um, writer and developer of Walking Dead and Outcast and other um, fairly successful IPs. Skybound is now in a round of investment where they are taking investment directly from the public. I believe they're attempting to raise 30 to $50 million, not from the traditional angel investor um, venture capitalists, but from individuals who are interested in owning um, a certain type of share in Skybound. So it's something that's I think is fairly unusual in comic book investment, but comic book investment in and of itself is not unusual. There are millions of people and substantial institutional investors who have invested in comic book companies or comic book conglomerates like BlackRock Investments, one of the largest, I think, investment banks or investment companies in the world, is one of the majority shareholders of Disney. People, you can invest in Discovery Plus because it's a publicly traded company. And I believe Valiant's also publicly traded. So you can invest in comic book companies. Is this this type of investment seems unusual? So Andy, my first question is, what do you, A, are you going to invest in Skybound? And B, if how do you actually see this, this financial move in light of what's going on with a lot of the other comic book publishers? Uh, I need to look into the details of like what they're, how they're asking for the money. Like, what do you get if you're investing? Is it just like some sort of stock option or whatever? So I, I don't know the details that well. I, I think I like it a little bit more in theory. I like it a little bit more than like just going to some giant conglomerate thing that's just going to throw money at you. Because at least it seems like fan engagement. Like if, if the idea is that the fans get to own the company, mm -hmm. I think that's kind of neat. That's not what it is because Kirkman and his partner, I think it's David Alpert, um, they're still going to own the company. They're going to own the majority, I'm, I'm sure. Like, I don't think it's mm -hmm. that. But, um, so, like, there's, but there's kind of this idea of, like, hey, fandom, you've been supporting us. Now you can own a piece of the company. Like, there's an idea there that I like. Mm -hmm. um, but then I'm also just kind of wondering, like, why are they doing this? Like, those two guys are, they're doing all right. Walking Dead, I don't, I don't know if you know this, but like Walking Dead and its various spinoffs, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like it did what we in the business call well. <laughs> and so I can only assume that they're, that they're fine. So I like, I feel like they could just run Skybound as is if they wanted, or if they wanted to make adjustments for one reason or another, then they could just do that. I, I don't know. It feels weird. Maybe, I don't know. It feels sort of disingenuous, like, mm -hmm. to me. But I'm old and curmudgeonly, and maybe I'm just wrong. I, but I, I like the, I think I like the idea of a company owned by fans. Yes. I think I like that idea. I don't know that I like the idea of fans giving rich creators money that they probably don't need. Well, the first thing, office. yeah, the first thing that I that I thought of when I saw the story is the idea of, and I don't know, based on the regulation and the investment channel and the tranche and all those other things, how this plays into it. However, just as a general rule, there's an idea called an investment called a qualified investor. That is a person who can look at a potential investment, see the upsides of the downsides, and understand the nature of the risk that they are taking when they invest in a company. And they also have a certain amount of money that they can afford to lose. So when in certain things, if you're forming a company or you're doing a certain type of offering, especially if it's a private offering, you can only go to qualified investors. That way you're not, you know, just taking money from people who don't really know what it is they're doing or what it is they could be losing. So if for anyone who can hear my voice, if you think you want to invest in Skybound, great. 
figure out what it is that you're getting, what it is that you're giving up, and what it is that you could potentially lose. Because it could be, and I don't know this for a fact, I am not making this accusation, but it could be that you put money into Skybound and then Skybound goes off and like IDW starts to finance their own films with this money, that money could quickly disappear. Now, if you were willing to lose that money because that was money that you weren't going to live off of, well, go ahead, because that is basically what investing is. But if you don't know what you're getting, then you probably should not be putting that money in. And so that's from the individuals who could potentially invest in Skybound. That is my, those are my thoughts. But for Skybound itself, as a observer of the industry and as an analyst for the industry, I kind of see Skybound's move in relation to a lot of other companies who are also having hard times raising money. Aftershock couldn't raise money. Aftershock is bankrupt. Heavy Metal stumbled in terms of raising their money. So they got into a place where they couldn't pay their bills. IDW is looking for investment to cover losses that they already know they're going to have. It seems like a lot of these companies, because of the recession, because of investment money drying up, seems like Skybound is just looking for a new way to raise money because they either know or feel that they can't raise money the way they traditionally raise money, yeah. which means they need money and they don't think they can get it from the investment banks, the venture capitalists. So they go, well, okay, we'll go to the fans directly to kind of get this money, which I would interpret. And again, I've not seen the financials, nor have I talked to a CPA related to the financials of Skybound, but if you need that money so that you have to now have creative investment strategies to get the money, I wouldn't be surprised if they don't get this money, that they wind up being on the list of those companies that are running into financial issues in spite of the fact of where Kirkman and his partners may be personally based on you know royalties and participation deals and producer credits on the Walking Dead thing. So from a looking at it from an individual investor standpoint, I would be cautious about looking at what it was I was investing. And from a broader standpoint, I'm wondering why Skybound, like you, why Skybound needed to take this move to kind of raise that money. So. Yeah, it makes me more uh, not nervous about Skybound, but it, I was not wondering, hey, is Skybound financially okay until this? And now yes. I'm like, oh, that doesn't look good. <laughs> now it may be fine. Like I, I have again, I have no real insight into that, right? I'm not, but but for that's what I saw uh, with it, and that was, and it changed my perception of Skybound in that regard. Um. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. It's also interesting too. Like you mentioned, like hey, we're in a recession, except technically we're not. We're not yet, and like the mm -hmm. prospects of of where our economy is going actually are really good right now, and, and yeah. have been like inflation is way down. Um, you know, all these things that we've been like panicking about all seem to be looking pretty good right now, despite the massive number of tech layoffs that we've all been mm -hmm. reading about. Um, employment has actually increased overall, right? Not in the tech industry, but overall in, in the industry so in the in the u.s so i think it's really uh, i actually think 2023 once i started actually looking into and like reading stuff from economists which i'm weird so i do that kind of thing i started to realize like we're actually 2023 is looking to me like potentially significantly better than 2022 oh. overall for the country but then once you start looking at the comics industry, the comics industry is still clearly very much behaving like doom, economic doom is on the horizon. And like yeah. sales are just down across the board and all that kind of stuff. And um, so there's, there's there's some inclement weather, maybe at best hurricane forces potentially ahead within the comics industry, I think in 2023. But I think this year is going to be, we're going to see a lot. Uh, you know, I think we started to see in 2022, I think we're going to see some shakeups in 2023. We're going to see some some really interesting stuff. 
um, yes. which will be probably very good for some people and probably very bad for others. Yes, that is that is usually the nature of change. Some people benefit, others do not. But what we will attempt to do here at the podcast and when we're having a lot of these more in-depth discussions within Comics Connection is helping people navigate where they're going to go and how they're going to actually adjust to all the changes in the market so they don't find themselves in over their skis when they're trying to build their company because we're actually talking about all the different financial and marketing and sales and distribution things that they have to consider in addition to, you know, all of the creative skills that they need to make their best comics. So once again, for like the fourth time, you're kind of four out of four today. That was a very good segue into wrapping this up because once again, we are over time. So um, thank you again, sir, for not coughing during the podcast and for sharing your insights. And thank you everybody for listening. The um, All of the links to the stuff we talked about is going to be in the show notes, along with some information if you want to join the Commerce Connection newsletter or if you want to actually join Commerce Connection directly and get access to our Discord and our video lessons and everything else. So until the next time, have fun with your comic. Take it easy, Andy. Thanks, Kamal. Later. All right, that's it. We're done. All right, we're done. Cool. And right. my in laws just rolled in, so I'm going to go say hi. Very good. Um, I will see you tomorrow, sir, at the uh, two o'clock meeting. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. All right. Have Bye. a good day. Later. Bye.